I'm Will Leviste. And I'm Eric Clavel. And you tune into Leviste and Clavel, where we tell it the way it is from a black male perspective. So let's get right to it. Today's show, Biden's first 100 days. Eric, you yeah. know, Eric, you know this idea of 100 days, you know, that goes back to Franklin Roosevelt's administration. He, ca- he called uh, Congress into a special session in 1933. You know, all of the drama mm-hmm. that was going on in 1933, you know, the Great Depression. Oh, yeah. And so ever since, there's been this idea of a new president comes in, first 100 days, they got to get some real things done. So everybody is now want to know, what is Biden going to be able to get done in his first 100 days in this climate? Yeah. Well, well, I think it's very important uh, that you mention the history behind the first 100 days, because a lot of times we just do things and don't know why we do it. Right. And during the time of Roosevelt, I mean, you're talking about a mess in our country. Uh, we're talking about the Great Depression um, president. We're talking about the person who took us out of, well, we were coming out of World War I, right. approximately around that time period. Our economy was fledgling, and the whole thing was going to come down upon itself. Sounds real familiar. Sounds real familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Man, look, right now, I, I, you know, we've got, we've got the economic turmoil. All right, we'll get into that later in the show. We've got the turmoil and the wreckage that was left from the Trump administration, right? Which things are coming out every single day about what he tried to do, what he actually did. You know, as a matter of fact, a report just came out talking about how he he was uh, trying to trying to create a plan to oust the acting attorney general. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. It's like it's like this guy (laughs) was operating with no real end game in mind. He was just moving making left turns, right turns, based on however. It's like the idea that the federal government can come in and tell a state how to run its elections is like, that's like the foundation of this of this nation, that the states have rights to operate in a certain way, and all 50 states agree to, you know, uh, uh, to, to bind themselves to the federal government, but the federal government doesn't come in and tell the states what to do. I mean, it's crazy. Well, you can't make this stuff. <laughs> Look, you know, I, I don't know if there's a, a Netflix series or a mini series or a movie that could be made on this, but you got to make it in, in stages. You know, Trump year one, two, three, four, right, right. And, and the end game. Uh, but, you know, Biden came in with a very challenging uh, situation, right. and we're still in it now. Uh, keep in mind, we're, we're not too far removed from the great insurrection, right? <laughs> where not just by the inside job that the president tried to pull, but also you got these groups that were trying to come into the Capitol and overturn the election, all because of overturning the election, all because democracy actually worked, right? So in these first hundred days, the, um, the executive orders that Biden signed was simply trying to get the country back on the train rails. We we can't even move yet, right? <laughs> right. This is. Did you see the Times, the Time Magazine cover that's just that's come out during the time that we're talking? Shows the the over office in a total mess and disarray, papers all over the place, and Biden standing there looking out looking out the window. And I mean, it's so. Figuratively, it's just so, you know, apt at what he's dealing with. So now yeah. he's got these first 100 days, he's dealing with a pandemic. He's dealing yeah. with an economy that's in shambles. He's dealing yeah. with uh, racial injustice that has come to the forefront, finally, that needs to be which dealt is, with. Which is, all, which is always existed now. Right, always existed, but it's, you know, it's come to the, to the, to the forefront in the sense that people who would, wanted to just ignore it have been yeah. forced to not be able to ignore it anymore. He's got immigration. That's that's going on that he wants to address. How is he going to get all these things done yeah. in the first 100 days? And <laughs> he's got a midterm election that is looming. So yes. the whole point of if he doesn't get things done now, yeah. then we're going to quickly go back to the, the same old state of let's just fight and resist and not get anything done and try to regain the House or regain the Senate. That's the posture that the Republicans are likely yeah. going to take. 
Well, you know, Will, you mentioned something about the pandemic, and that is mm-hmm. number one. We got to get that under control. But <clears throat> let me go back to the importance of the first 100 days and the midterm, right? So the most power that any president has in his first administration is the first 15 to 18 months. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because everybody that's running for re-election has to get on board and do and 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 do whatever they're going to do, right? Or if, not do if it means right. Win election, right? <laughs> like 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 what I call cool hand Mitch, uh, Mitch McConnell. Right. You know, uh, he never shows his hand. And for for all of those millennials out there to know who cool hand is, uh, that's from Cool Hand Luke, right? <laughs> <laughs> A famous movie back in the day, but. But, you know, one of the issues that they have to do is there were some controversial, quote, and I put those in quotation marks, right? Those, there were some controversial bills that are coming through that there are some congresspersons that are going to have to vote for that may end up costing them some votes if they do it later right. in this particular session. That's why the first 100 days are so important. Now, the GOP really don't stand a chance, right? Because right now, you know, they're in an internal battle where they're eating themselves, right? They're, they're consuming their own. Uh, they don't know if it's the party of Trump. They don't know if it's the party of the establishment of Mitch McConnell. They have no idea what's going on, right? The, you know, you got Ted Cruz and Senator Hawley that's uh, wanting to, you know, they don't know if they want to kick them out of the Senate, have them resign or take away some of their committee hearing uh, committee assignments, whatever the case may be. Right. But the but the first hundred days is going to be absolutely crucial. And I think we should start to look at, you know, some of the executive orders that uh, President Biden actually signed. Because again, this is to put America back on the train rails. Then we can start that train moving. All right. right because we got to get that train moving. I mean, we've talked about before in previous shows about how America's train prior to Trump Let's not get it twisted. The train (laughs) wasn't moving that well. The America's train prior to Obama wasn't moving very well at all. And that's what led to Obama. So a lot of people ended up jumping the train over to the Trump train because their lives still hadn't changed significantly because of the fight that the the, uh, Republican Party put up because of the you know, I think the lack of boldness on the Democratic Party a lot of times during the Obama administration to really get some bold things done beyond health care, which was very, very important. Yeah. So to right. just get the train back is not enough. It's got to. So he's got a mess that he got to clean up and he's got to get the country moving forward beyond where it was that actually led to Trump. So how's he going to do this? Now, Will, you, you mentioned a train, but I want to interject here. The train has been moving for some Americans, right? Right. <laughs> you know, it hasn't been moving for Main Street America. But I, I don't know if you looked at your 401k. I don't know if you looked at your investments. But over the past, since, since Obama came into office, uh, after Bush left, <clears throat> with the stock market down into the 6,000s, that went up to 19,000. And then when Trump came into office, he took it from 20,000 to 30,000. And then even after um, Biden got into office, it's gone up to 31,000. And I'm talking about the Dow index, right? right? So if you've got investments, if you've got a 401k, you know, you, that train is riding very well. All right. So it's going up. And if you're in the top 3% of our economy, you are in your first class, right? So uh, the tax cuts that were given by Trump and to those individuals, uh, that particular uh, train has been riding extremely well. Now, let's get to the other 97, 95%. That's what um, we're talking about. That's what we're talking right? about. Right. But, but, but I wanted to make sure that we address the top 3% who's ever watching the show, that you're doing extremely well. Matter of fact, you've done better in the last 12 years than you've done in the last 50 years. Well, you talking about you, Eric? You talking about you? That's it. <laughs> You like, and your wife, you and your wife and them, okay. Look, look, well, I'm, I'm addressing the top three, five percent, right? So this show is for everybody. But, 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 but again, to your point, you know, the 95 percent is not doing well at all. Right. You know, I mean, you've got since Enron, let's go back to the early 2000s, folded with Ken Lay, uh, since the um, 
te first tech bubble back in the early 2000s. Then you got the mortgage bubble in 2008, 2009. Right, right. And then you got the Occupy Wall Street movement after 2009, 2010, 2011. And then you got the Tea Party movement that came out of that. Right. And then from there, you've got now individuals who there are more people, more people will, who can't pay their rent. Right. Right. They're behind in their rent. Then you have people who actually can't pay their mortgage. Now, the significance of that is people that lost their homes during the mortgage crisis actually moved into apartments. Right, right. So really, you've got not only that group of people, right, and I'm talking about in the millions, that are behind three months or more behind on their rent. That's 90 days, okay? There's no way you're going to catch up on that, all right? And then you've got that group of individuals who are good uh, work hard workers, Americans working minimum wage jobs that simply don't have enough money, right, to make ends meet. So you got those two pots of right, people right. that are in danger of being kicked out of their home. That's why one, one of the executive orders that President Biden signed, which is so important, was he extended the moratorium right. for evictions. I mean, you know, where where, where you are in, in, in large cities, you know, you've seen the homes, right? right? Philadelphia, absolutely, yes. Yeah, you look, it was Philadelphia, even D.C., right? I mean, you see homeless, New York City. We go to the West Coast, you know, to, to L.A. We can go to other cities. But the homeless situation is real. And that and that freeze on the on, on uh, that moratorium to stop evictions was monumental. And that's why, you know, we're we're dealing with a country that's very much desperate, you know, and that's why... Again, I've said this, said this before. I believe that a lot of people turn to Trump because out of desperation, let's let's move this train for me in some way. Let's do something different. And so yeah. now we've got some. We've seen how risky that has been. We've seen how reckless that has been. We see how Trump has pimped people's pain. <laughs> essentially, I mean that's what he's absolutely yeah. done. Advanced his friends. And his, you know, and his, uh, his lackeys, but has essentially pimp people's pain. So now, oh Biden, uh, Biden, who has this understanding, this it's one of his his hallmarks of being able to deal with and relate to people's pain, relate to people's grief, is now the person has been picked to move us forward. But remember, you still got seventy million people. That voted against, 71, 71. That voted against uh, yeah. Biden. So for the Republican Party, there's still as a, as much of disarray that they're in. They're still looking at how many people voted for their party, who voted against Biden, who still voted, even if they didn't vote so much for Trump, they were voting against going back to what was. So yeah. they're still looking at that. And so now Biden very much represents yeah. what was and normalcy and all that. But if that normalcy <clears throat> isn't working, then that's not very attractive either. So he's got yeah. to do something in these first 100 days yeah. that's going to overcome that reality. But, 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 but Will, you know, the, the significance of what Biden is doing in these executive orders is that it's not specifically, you know, there are a few things that are there for specific groups, right? But overall, these executive orders that are putting our country back on track to right. get the train moving helps everybody, right? So let's take a look at this. Right. You know, we mentioned the moratorium. You know, now there are some issues with how do uh, loan holders get paid? How do landlords get paid? Who is this really helping? Who is this really hurting? The mom and pop and the, uh, uh, owners of property that can't evict people because they can't pay. So the eviction is just kind of there in the clerk of court's office right. as opposed to these huge apartment owners, right? Now, the other, but, but the other part of it is the pandemic, okay? First of all, there was no COVID-19 vaccination plan. No plan. The plan, <laughs> you know, the plan, the plan was that there was no plan. That was the plan. That, man, look, and keep in mind that Trump in his farewell speech took credit for the rollout. But warp speed was pretty much a debacle, right? right? Um, the, the rollout of it was was absolutely incoherent. 
And you saw Fachi in his first uh, press conference at the White House. I mean, he looked like a kid that just left Christmas, right? <laughs> he was so happy to, he's like, I'm so happy to deal with an administration where we can let the science speak. You know, he was speaking freely without the president hovering over him, looking at him, saying, you can inject bleach into your body and kill the uh, co- you know, coronavirus, which didn't exist, by the way, and would go away very quickly. But 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 the pan, executive order for the pandemic to get the rollout of vaccination to ramp it up, and another thing, Will, what he implemented was he's now using. You mentioned Roosevelt. He's using right. now the Defense Author, Authorization Act in order to start rolling out these vaccinations for people, which is tremendous, right? So now we got va- va- vaccines that are coming about. We've got protection that's coming out, PPP. We've got all these things that we needed in the very beginning that's that's starting to happen. Secondly, he's also implemented a mandatory uh, mask mandate for anybody entering federal buildings and also for federal contractors. And then thirdly, he's implemented a 100-day mask challenge to states and municipalities to implement in order to stop the spread, to curb the spread of COVID-19. So we talk about, you know, people that, you know, hey, didn't vote for uh, President Biden, but he said he was going to be a president for all, which I admire him for saying, because clearly in the last four years, we did not have a president that was for all. He uh, simply, and nor did we have a Senate that was for all. They simply uh, started to go toward their base only, right? And things that help their uh, right, the people uh, that put them in that office. Let's take, let's take care of the people that put us in office so they can keep reelecting us in office and so that they can pursue their own ambitions. So we're, we look at this and, and, you know, we care about Black people. We look at this and what we do here is, is from a Black yeah. perspective. So in what Biden is doing, in what Biden has on tap to do, what do yeah. you see as being critical and actually being beneficial to Black people that he is, is going to have to focus on these first 100 days? Well, Will, let me first start with student loans. Hmm. He extended the forbearance, uh, zero interest and also forbearance on student loans into October of 2021. That is absolutely monumental, right? So by the time individuals have to start paying their federal student loans back, uh, we're looking at at least about a year to probably 15 months to 18 months where individuals have, have had an opportunity to catch up, right? And that's still, that's a suspension on interest still, right? It's not a current. Exactly. Current Zero percent interest. You're exactly right. That's huge, right? Because think about it. We've got individuals that have graduated virtually, but where are the jobs in the job market, mm-hmm. right? Because of the pandemic. So for people who think that these individuals are getting a pass, that's not the case. And for African-American students, we know, according to the statistics by the Department of Education and others, that African-Americans have to borrow more or depend more upon student loans because of the uh, lack of uh, extra money outside uh, that they can depend upon to help them pay for their education. You know, I was talking to one university president, and they mentioned important statistics. They said... Our students have an issue not getting into school, but their community, their village, spends all of their money getting them in, but they don't have any additional money to get them out. So really, for a lot of students, it's between $500 and $2,500 to graduate. Hmm. (laughs) And they can't graduate or get their degree or walk unless they pay that balance. That's the difference between changing their generation. So that's huge. You know, student loan forbearance. But what I would like to see is student loan forgiveness. And, and Will, you know that, you know, all of us have gone through education. All of us have we've gotten our degrees. We both right. have doctors, I professional did. But if you didn't come from wealth, if you didn't come from wealth, you had to, you had to pay for it, brother. <laughs> Oftentimes with student loans, exactly. That's right. Look, my law degree was on me, right? right. I was out of my father's house. My father... Uh, was a small business owner. He also worked an additional job, and he taught us, you know, have multiple streams of income. And he put all of his kids through college, which is, uh, again, tremendous, right? But once you got that first degree, you got your first job. After that, it was pretty much on you. So scholarships help, uh, but at the but to get over that hump, 
you know, graduate school, professional schools are very expensive. So we like to see some type of uh, forgiveness in student loans. Now they're talking maybe $10,000, $50,000, you know, but to you, what do you think is an appropriate amount? All of it, a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some, you know, of, us, some of us had these advanced degrees. You know, we we had to go up into the hundreds. You know, to um, but I think that uh, I think that uh, definitely fifty somewhere in the fifty thousand range. You know, looking at what is the total debt out there and the average debt that that is really loading people down, and yeah. looking at a, a significant number because just five thousand. If you've got a fifty thousand dollar debt, or if you got a seventy five thousand dollar debt, which a lot of students have, when you look at the cost of education, some yeah. schools four years, you know, being thirty thousand or more, you know, you, you're talking about state school. When you and I'm, yeah. I'm and I'm adding, I'm not, I haven't gotten to private the, schools. Yeah, yeah. So not to even mention <laughs> private schools. So when you look at it that way, to to forgive at a significant amount is what really needs to be done because. What it'll do is that will free up money to go into the economy for purchasing of homes, for purchasing, for starting businesses, the types of things that generate income. So just like they forgave um, debt during the uh, last economic uh, downturn, depression, uh, bailed out the banks or bailed out the auto industry. That's right. This is a similar approach. If you bail out, People who are weighted down with student loan debt, yeah. they're and they're going to be able to turn that additional money around and actually invest it in the economy. So I think it's got to be significant. They can't just do five or ten thousand, you know, for somebody that has a seventy-five thousand dollar, you know, student loan. Debt. Now look, I, I'm going to go a step further. Yeah, you know, I think I think we need to start looking at smart policy, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think that you should actually pay interest. On, on loans from the government in order to go to school. Mm-hmm. Because the, I think you should you should pay fees. I think fees for getting the program going for distribution of uh, your actual student loan and monies to help you get through school. I think that's, that's fine. But why are we paying interest? It's that compound interest that's putting students under a major uh, burden. So I believe you eliminate some student loan debt, if not all, mm-hmm. okay, all would be great, but definitely eliminate some, you can't eliminate all. I think you also uh, forgive all interests and penalties, all right, and only keep the fees that are there. So that way, let's just say you borrow, you know, $20,000 for undergrad to go, go to school, then, and you have five to $10,000 of interest, that that five to 10000 interest is taken off and you only pay that $20,000 back. And I think that persons that pay their loans back over 10 years after that 10-year period, the loans are forgiven. I think that's <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a sound plan. I mean, that's similar to what, you know, what is already in place is what you mentioned about the 10 years. And if you work for, I think, in a nonprofit sector, yeah. some type of service sector, teachers, um, anyone that's just delivering some kind of public service yeah. or nonprofit, you continue to pay at a consistent yeah. rate. You can get them totally forgiven, but that, that program, um, all the indicators has been news that have come out. Yeah. That's been a mess in terms exactly. of applying exactly. a term. Yeah. Of, so it's almost like the government sets up these programs and sets up these things that give people incentives, and then makes it hard, makes it difficult for them to actually be able to execute on it. So it's almost like the desires I really not to even have people take advantage of these things. And again, I think that has that is one of the things that's really at the core of what has really got people uh, anxious, upset, angry. Is that there's so the, our government and our society makes things so difficult for certain people to actually be able to lift themselves up by them bootstraps to actually have uh, upward mobility. And I think that Biden and the entire Congress uh, has got to look at what is the root that led to this desperate state that we find ourselves in. And we can't, it's unsustainable to keep behaving in the same manner. And how can we go and actually put forth policies that's going to move the needle for people? And I think the idea, some of the things that you pointed out, again, the the economic ideas, when it comes to African-Americans in this country, that's what we really have to put our focus on. I'd like to see him 
in these first 100 days, not only bail out the economy, but actually put in place things that enable people, for example, to start businesses, to to start yeah. to to purchase homes. Not just not just right. jobs. We need jobs, but actually right. also wealth building uh, uh, vehicles and get yeah. people engaged in that. Hey, Will, you're exactly right. And one thing that the Trump administration tried to do, you know, they tried to simplify certain things, but of course we knew that there was some uh, finagling going back that it really wasn't going to help the average person. Mm-hmm. But you're exactly right. Streamline these opportunities and these processes so that the average person can understand it. You don't need a dictionary or a lawyer you know, to interpret the rules and regulations. But there's one more thing I want to address, and I know that we don't have that much time. And look, you know, we could talk about these issues forever, but I want everybody to continue to tune in, you know, as we our shows release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so we can elaborate upon these issues. But one last thing I want to address as it relates to African Americans is that racial inequality, all right, social injustice and racial equity is going to be studied across uh, all federal agencies. And they're going to uh, include again the uh, uh training of what well, they call it sensitivity training, mm-hmm. but it's actually training about, you know, the history of African Americans and the history about inclusiveness and diversity over agencies. Uh, you know, it is one thing that I've seen, Bill, is that anytime we start talking about the full history of America, you get a lot of companies, a lot of white Americans that say, we don't want to, we don't want to hear that. Uh, now you're giving us indoctrinating indoctrinating us with liberal values. No. It's history. Rewriting right? history, yeah. Re, re, reconstructing yeah. history, yeah. No, we're not reconstructing history. We're including what you intentionally left out. Absolutely. Okay? You know, we could go back through the history of the Daughters of the Confederacy and all that and their plan uh, to eliminate the evil of the Civil War and the evil of white America upon black America and also Native Americans. Uh, but it's time now, as we talk about inclusiveness, as we talk about diversity, is that we now accept a whole history, right? And that's one thing that I think that the Biden administration, we've got a good chance, we've got a good chance, right, to do that under his administration, um, of course, with uh, Vice President Harris uh, and her background and also bringing up uh, her plan and and her plan for HBCUs and her history of HBCUs. I think that that is a huge opportunity for us all. But, But as we saw, with the insurrection that happened <laughs> just recently, there is another side that is ready to put up a fight to not see this America that Biden has talked about that is more embracing, more inclusive. Yeah. There's another side. So we've got to stay ready. Gotta be ready. We got to get in. We got to keep the uh, accountability, keep our foot to the pedal when it comes that's to it. keeping my people uh, accountable. But that's all that we got this week. <laughs> Our producer, Ben Bailey, behind the scenes, keeping everything right and tight. We appreciate our sponsors, our supporters. We appreciate you for tuning in. Exactly. And look, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also on our website at lavisandclaville.com. And if you have a question, email us at lavisandclaville at gmail.com, and we'll definitely get back to you. Because at the end of the day, to us, that's the way it is. We'll see you next week. All right. That was good, man. Hey, I, I enjoyed that. 